for examine the major reasons behind the decline in current account deficit of India. Do you think the present decline is sustainable? Suggest reasons in support of your view. Hint, the current account deficit in India recently touched its lowest of less than 2% of GDP. This is despite the higher merchandise import bill, same amount of remittances and almost flat growth rate in service income. The major reasons behind its decline are strong FDI and FDI flows oil prices are still low due to a boom in shale gas in US AGOVD's curve on gold imports and various gold monetization schemes high value of rupee this a this dollar reducing the import bill however the present decline is not sustainable as US the economy has started showing signs of improvement after presidential election and there may be a change in its policy affecting FDI and flows in India the import bill consists of around 80% oil imports Although there are less signs of oil price shocks, but due to unrest in Middle Asia and ISIS, we must be ready for every situation. The GOVD's policy to curb gold imports has not borne much fruit. High value of rupee decreases the competitiveness of our exports in international market. The GOVT has taken adequate steps like passing of GSI Act which will make our exports more competitive, liberalizing FDI regime by bringing almost all items under automatic approval route, presenting the red carpet to investors all over the world, skilling people etc. to keep a cab in check. The associated concepts there are various factors which could cause the current account deficit. 1. Fixed exchange rate, if the currency is overvalued imports will be cheaper and therefore there will be a higher queue of imports. Exports will become uncompetitive and therefore there will be a fall in the quantity of exports. 2. Economic growth. If there is an increase in national income, people will tend to have more disposable income to consume goods. If domestic producers cannot meet the domestic demand, consumers will have to import goods from abroad. In the UK we have a high marginal propensity to imports because we do not have a comparative advantage in the production of manufactured goods. Therefore, if there is fast economic growth there tends to be a significant increase in the quantity of imports. 3. Decline in competitiveness. In the UK, there has been a decline in the exporting manufacturing sector, because it has struggled to compete with developing countries in the Far East. This has led to a persistent deficit in the balance of trade. Higher inflation. This makes exports less competitive and imports more competitive. However, this factor may be offset by a decline in the value of sterling. Recession in other countries. If the UK's main trading partners experience negative economic growth then they will buy less of our exports, worsening the current account. Borrowing money. If countries are borrowing money to invest e.g. third world countries. 5. China is accused of indulging in bad bird eye neighbor policy. Explain the term and examine its consequences on rest of world. Hint, beggar thy neighbor policy refers to a policy that aims at addressing one's own domestic problems at the expense of others, trading partners in particular. It utilizes currency devaluations and protective barriers to alleviate the nation's economic difficulties at the expense of other countries. Conventionally, countries often impose tariff barriers and restrict imports to protect their domestic industries. However, with globalization, such practices are not possible. Beyond the level, central banks devalue or encourage the depreciation of their own currencies compared to its trading partners by intervening in the local currency markets to retain their respective competitive edge and price advantage in exports. After China devalued its currency by nearly 0.5% to the dollar, many emerging market currencies have started weakening against the US dollar and it would end up in currency wars through competitive devaluation. China is expecting to sustain its economic growth rate based on export, however this practice is hurting the trade balance of other emerging countries like India as imports from China is high. Competitive devaluation is viewed as being harmful or deleterious to the global economy because it may set off a round of currency wars that may have unforeseen adverse consequences such as increased protectionism and trade barriers. At the very least, Competitive devaluation may lead to greater currency volatility and higher hedging costs for importers and exporters, which may impede the higher level of international trade. In the current situation of global economic slowdown and weak demand, the price advantage on goods and services need not necessarily prop up exports. In certain cases, such a policy may prove counterproductive. If, 
For instance, even the competing country countered one policy move of, say, depreciation to protect exports then such a practice may not have desirable results, especially the country's imports are not price elastic. The imports are essential and not dependent on prices and instead could end up hurting the trade balance through higher import price and resulting in inflation in such economies. The current non-system is pushing the world toward competitive monetary easing to know one's ultimate benefit, developing a consensus for free trade and responsible global citizenship, and thus resisting parochial pressures, would set the stage for the sustainable growth the world desperately needs. Multilateral institutions like the International Monetary Fund should exercise their responsibility for maintaining the stability of the global system by analyzing and passing careful judgment on each unconventional monetary policy. Associated concepts The idea behind beggar thy neighbor policies is the protection of the domestic economy by reducing imports and increasing exports. That is usually achieved by encouraging consumption of domestic goods over imports using protectionist policies such as import tariffs or quotas to limit the amount of imports. Often the domestic currency is devaluated as well, which makes domestic goods cheaper for foreigners to buy, resulting in more exports of domestic goods abroad. Although the precise origin of the term beggar thy neighbor is not known, Adam Smith, the Scottish philosopher who is also considered to be the founder of modern economics, made a reference to it when he critiqued mercantilism, the dominant economic system in Europe from the 16th to the 18th century. According to Smith, the doctrine of mercantilism taught that nations should beggar all their neighbors to maximize economic gains. Smith believed that long-term gains from free trade would far outweigh the short-term benefits that might be derived from the protectionist policies advocated by the mercantilists. Economists after Smith confirmed his belief through research that showed that adopting such policies could trigger trade wars, the situation in which countries repeatedly retaliate against each other by raising tariffs on each other's products. Trade wars tend to push the countries involved in them toward autarky. A system of economic self-sufficiency and limited trade, which could be detrimental for economic growth. Beggar thy neighbor policies have been used by many countries throughout history. They were widely popular during the Great Depression of the 1930s, when countries desperately tried to prevent their domestic industries from failing. After World War I, I Japan followed a model of Economic development that relied heavily on protecting its domestic industries from foreign competition until they were mature enough to compete with foreign firms. Post-Cold War China followed a similar set of policies to limit foreign influence on domestic producers. 6. Elaborate on various types of non-tariff trade barriers, with help of examples. Why their use is on rise in last decade. Hence, the non-tariff barrier is a form of restrictive trade practice that result from prohibitions conditions, or specific market requirements that make importation or exportation of products difficult and slash or costly. Non-tariff barriers include quotas, embargoes, sanctions, levies and other restrictions and are frequently used by large and developed economies. Non-tariff barriers are another way for an economy to control the amount of trade that it conducts with another economy, either for selfish or altruistic purposes. Entities arise from different measures taken by governments and authorities in the form of government laws, regulations, policies, conditions, restrictions or specific requirements, and private sector business practices, or prohibitions that protect the domestic industries from foreign competition. Quantity restrictions, quotas and licensing procedures. Under this system, the maximum quantity of different commodities which would be allowed to be imported over a period of time from various countries is fixed in advance. Quotas are very often combined with licensing system to regulate the flow of imports over the quota period as also to allocate them between various importers and supplying countries. In this system a license or permit has to be obtained from the government to import the goods mentioning the quantity and the country from which to import. Technical and administrative regulations, the imposition of technical production, technical specifications etc. to which an importing commodity must conform. Such type of technical restriction is imposed in case of pharmaceutical products, etc. Besides technical restrictions, administrative restrictions such as adherence to certain documentary procedures are adopted to regulate imports. These measures impede the free flow of trade to a large extent. Preferential state procurement policies, where government favor local producers when finalizing contracts for state spending. Domestic subsidies 
aid for domestic businesses facing financial problems e.g. subsidies for car manufacturers or loss-making airlines. Quality conditions imposed by the importing country on the exporting countries. Unjustified sanitary and phytosanitary conditions. Unreasonable slash unjustified packaging, labeling, product standards are antibodies. It has become commonplace to use the tariffs to restrict international trade has been gradually replaced in recent years by the use of antibodies. The reasons include, WTO membership effectively rules out imposition of tariff barriers, which is very transparent compared to non-tariff barriers. Tariff barriers are not very effective, as they raise the price, but the effect on demand may be limited. As a protective measure, non-tariff barriers are more effective as they restrict imports within the required limits. Tariffs are not flexible. They can be imposed quickly, but it is difficult to remove due to the opposition of powerful vested interests. Quotas non-tariff barriers tend to be more flexible, more easily imposed and more easily removed. Tariff barriers restrict imports indirectly. Non-tariff barriers restrict imports directly. Other reasons include institutional constraints such as are built into the WTO and other trade agreements. Tariff barriers are directly banned, however, entities are allowed in good faith to avoid market failure and domestic problems, interactions among various forms of trade policy and market structure, ways that one country may react to or retaliate against the trade policies of another country, differences among policies and the extent to which they engender rent-seeking behavior and differences among policies in the ways that they perform in an uncertain world. Though it is required that entities should not be used to distort the trade in favor of particular country but used to protect the public interests only. 7. India doesn't need second green revolution, but an ever green revolution. Analyze this statement of Dr. Swaminathan, also, examine the market distortion in above context. Hence, the Green Revolution of the 60s helped to instill self-confidence in our agricultural capability and also to purchase time in relation to achieving a balance between population growth and food production. Such revolutionary progress, particularly in the production of wheat and rice, became possible through synergy between technology and public policy supported by farmers' enthusiasm generated through national demonstrations in the field of resource-poor farmers with small holdings. Drawbacks of Green Revolution from the 90s onwards there has been a deceleration in the rate of growth of food production. It is widely felt that there has been a fatigue of the Green Revolution. Simultaneously, several environmental and economic problems hampering agricultural growth have appeared. The intensive cultivation of land without conservation of soil fertility and soil structure has led, ultimately, to the springing up of deserts. Irrigation without arrangements for drainage would result in soils getting alkaline or saline. Indiscriminate use of pesticides, fungicides and herbicides could cause adverse changes in biological balance as well as lead to an increase in the incidence of cancer and other diseases through the toxic residues present in the grain or other edible parts. The rapid replacement of numerous locally adapted varieties with one or two high yielding strains in large contiguous areas would result in the spread of serious diseases capable of wiping out entire crops. Idea of evergreen revolution thus, we need an evergreen revolution rather than a second green revolution. The stress is on increasing yield without environmental and social costs. This also involves a shift from product based approach to a farming based approach. Evergreen revolution is a more sustainable concept to green revolution, so that we can cultivate food and other crops without damaging soil fertility and the natural foundations that are needed for long-term agricultural prosperity. At the production end, there is need for integrating frontier technologies like biotechnology, information and communication technologies, space and nuclear technology and renewable energy technologies such as solar, wind, biogas and biomass based energy systems with traditional ecological prudence. Conservation farming is the pathway to an evergreen revolution. The greatest problem with applying conservation agriculture concepts in dry land areas is the lack of adequate quantities of crop residues. The removal of crop residues for alternative uses accelerates the already fast decline of soil organic matter content in dry land areas. Long-term sustainability of dry land soils may be significantly enhanced by reduced tillage that leaves more crop residues on the soil surface. Besides enhancing soil fertility and soil organic matter, the need for the economic and efficient use of irrigation water cannot be overemphasized. 
Increasing crop water use by 25 to 35 millimeter can substantially increase the average yield of cereals in dry farming areas. This can be readily achieved by conservation agriculture. High input costs, uncertain rainfall and poor income lead to widespread indebtedness. The younger generation will be reluctant to take up farming as long as income prospects are poor. Declining terms of trade between farm and non-farm sections is a matter of concern. The eastern areas urgently need an evergreen revolution that would benefit lots of small landholders through agriculture and associated sectors. Market distortion and sustainable farming similarly, there is a need to rationalize the MSP and fertilizer balance issue which had happened because of massive subsidies on urea. This has created the overuse of three nutrients and PK, affecting the fertility of soil in the long run. The MSP policy has been skewed towards wheat and rice and this has promoted the cultivation of these at cost of other crops, affecting the farm diversity in India. The pricing policy for farm commodities should have the following components. Minimum support price MSP announced before the sowing season. MSP should be cost plus 50%, i.e. 50% more than the total cost of production. Thus, the farmer-friendly integrated MSP, procurement price and post-procurement adjustment system will help our farmers to tap the existing unutilized yield reservoir and thereby improve the productivity and profitability of small farms. The associated concepts history and development of the Green Revolution The beginnings of the Green Revolution are often attributed to Norman Borlaug, an American scientist interested in agriculture. In the 1940s, he began conducting research in Mexico and developed new disease-resistant high-yield varieties of wheat. By combining Borlaug's sweet varieties with new mechanized agricultural technologies, Mexico was able to produce more wheat than was needed by its own citizens, leading to its becoming an exporter of wheat by the 1960s. Prior to the use of these varieties, the country was importing almost half of its wheat supply. Due to the success of the Green Revolution in Mexico, its technology spread worldwide in the 1950s and 1960s. The United States, for instance, imported about half of its wheat in the 1940s but after using Green Revolution technologies, it became self-sufficient in the 1950s and became an exporter by the 1960s. In order to continue using Green Revolution technologies to produce more food for a growing population worldwide, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation as well as many government agencies around the world funded increased research. In 1963, with the help of this funding, Mexico formed an international research institution called the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. Countries all over the world in turn benefited from the Green Revolution work conducted by Borlaug and this research institution. India, for example, was on the brink of mass famine in the early 1960s because of its rapidly growing population. Borlaug and the Ford Foundation then implemented research there and they developed a new variety of rice, IR8, that produced more grain per plant when grown with irrigation and fertilizers. Today, India is one of the world's leading rice producers and IR8 rice usage spread throughout Asia in the decades following the rice's development in India. Plant technologies of the Green Revolution The crops developed during the Green Revolution were high-yield varieties meaning they were domesticated plants bred specifically to respond to fertilizers and produce an increased amount of grain per acre planted. The terms often used with these plants that make them successful are harvest index, photosynthate allocation, and insensitivity to day length. The harvest index refers to the above ground weight of the plant. During the Green Revolution, plants that had the largest seeds were selected to create the most production possible. After selectively breeding these plants, they evolved to all have the characteristic of larger seeds. These larger seeds then created more grain yield and heavier above ground weight. This larger above ground weight then led to an increased photosynthate allocation. By maximizing the seed or food portion of the plant, it was able to use photosynthesis more efficiently because the energy produced during this process went directly to the food portion of the plant. Finally, by selectively breeding plants that were not sensitive to date length, Researchers like Borlaug were able to double a crop's production because the plants were not limited to certain areas of the globe based solely on the amount of light available to them. Impacts of the Green Revolution Since fertilizers are largely what make the Green Revolution possible, they forever changed agricultural practices because the high-yield varieties developed during this time cannot grow successfully without the help of fertilizers. 
Irrigation also played a large role in the Green Revolution and this forever changed the areas where various crops can be grown. For instance, before the Green Revolution, agriculture was severely limited to areas with a significant amount of rainfall, but by using irrigation, water can be stored and sent to drier areas, putting more land into agricultural production, thus increasing nationwide crop yields. In addition, the development of high-yield varieties meant that only a few species of safe rice started being grown. In India, for example, there were about 30,000 rice varieties prior to the Green Revolution. Today there are around 10, all the most productive types. By having this increased crop homogeneity though the types were more prone to disease and pests, because there were not enough varieties to fight them off. In order to protect these few varieties then, pesticide use grew as well. Finally, the use of green revolution technologies exponentially increased the amount of food production worldwide. Places like India and China that once feared famine have not experienced it since implementing the use of IR, 8 ice and other food varieties.